Magic. Please welcome aboard Gary. Cruising on Disney is like no other cruise that I've been on. And so the cruising tips that normally work for me on most lines didn't work on Disney. So here are 13 things that I stumbled across, mistakes I made, that if I had known, I would have had a much better cruise experience on Disney. And so I'm Gary Bembridge, and I really want you to know about them so you can have a great Disney cruise. Disney is a themed cruise. Be ready for it because there's no escape once you're on board and immersed in that Disney kingdom. Whilst mo most other cruise ships are floating hotels, this is very much a unique Disney-packed kingdom at sea. Disney magic is weaved into everything, the decor, the entertainment, the food, the cabins, pretty much everything is Disney-fied. One thing I would recommend you do though is go on the Art of the Theme tours. They run multiple times across the cruise and I recommend, if you can, actually even going multiple times because each different cast member that runs them, as they call them, they tell you about the different things that interest them, but they tell you about the design, where hidden things are. It really is quite fascinating. And long time Disney cruises still go back time and time again because each tour has a little different spin on it. And they keep going because they keep discovering new things. Now, as Disney is a fully themed cruise, in my view, it's absolutely best for people that love and know Disney or are going with someone who does. And increasingly, by the way, you also need to brush up on your Marvel and Star Wars universes because they're being weaved in. I missed out so much because I didn't know enough about Disney. For example, at Rapunzel's Royal Table night where I had one of my dinners, I didn't understand the show. I didn't know why it was a birthday party. Things like that I just didn't appreciate. When I went to the Frozen Deck show, I didn't really understand who the characters were and what was going on. So bear in mind, you do need to brush up on your Disney before you go to get the most out of it. There's something even more important to know before you go. Disney Cruise Line travelers are incredibly dedicated, fast moving and efficient. I moved out by not understanding that. People zoom in, they lock down anything that can possibly be booked as soon as they can, especially dining, activities, events, excursions. So when these things go on sale at one minute after midnight Eastern Standard Time for a cruise, people are online booking right there and then. So importantly, access is based on your past cruiser status. So for example, I was a first time guest. I could only start booking 70 days prior to the date of my sailing. I actually left a little bit later than that. And by the time I went in, Many things that I really wanted to do, like excursions or some of the tastings, were booked out. Now, concierge guests, it's kind of the sweet guests, platinum castaway club members, they get double that amount of time that I got before sailing to go in and book. So if you are desperate to do something specific, you need to move quickly as soon as that window opens for you. The next thing I discovered is that you absolutely need to be tech savvy and have a smartphone. Download the app because Disney has pretty much no paper on board. Even in most of the restaurants, I needed to scan a QR code to look at the menu. Everything pretty much happens on the app. All your bookings, your bill, times to meet for excursions, the daily program, everything. So you need to have a really good smartphone, know how to use it. And it is actually pretty hard to find out what's going on without the app. When it comes to packing, there's something that I had underappreciated even though I knew about it. Basically, there's no real dress code. You're able to go to dinner even on formal nights in shorts and t-shirts if you want. Most of the locations in the evening for dining are what they call cruise casual. Themed deck party nights are a different story and Disney guests totally embrace them. Now, you don't have to dress up for those themed deck party nights, but having a nod to the theme is a really good idea, whether it's pirates or whatever. Now, we had a frozen night and many people dressed up in outfits linked to the various characters from the film. There is, by the way, the one formal night, one semi-formal night where you can bring out your kind of your blazers and your gowns. A lot of people did that because they wanted the photographs. But again, it's not enforced. If you want to wear t-shirts and shorts, you can. If you're going into the adult specialty restaurants like Paolo, I had on Disney Magic, or Remy on some of the other ships, it's really important that you do have to wear something smarter. Many people, by the way, on the cruise wear Disney merchandise, they wear Mickey Mouse ears day and night. So to feel part of the atmosphere, you may actually want to bring those along too. The other thing that I'd unappreciated but soon discovered 
is that Disney cruise ships do miss some of the things that I normally expect on a cruise, so be ready for that. So for example, there's no casino because gambling is supposedly not within their family-friendly policy. However, they did do bingo, which is gambling, and they actually let kids play it if they're with an adult. So, you know, they do actually have gambling on board. There is no drinks package, again, which you used to on many cruises. Again, I guess linked to the adults, family thing. So you buy, drink by drink, and many people find that really ramped up from a cost perspective. The other thing which they didn't have were enrichment programs with talks, which I have on many cruises I go on. I was traveling to the fjords, I kind of expected that, but there were no talks about the area. So be ready for some of those usual things to be missing. The next key thing that I think is important is around cabins. Now I personally, I'm kind of obsessed with cabins anyway, so I'm quite picky about the one I choose anyway. But on Disney, I found this to be even more so. Now many people argue that the cabins on Disney are slightly larger than on comparable premium kind of ships. I, to be honest, I didn't feel it was bigger, even though I'd booked a family deluxe cabin. Uh, you know, it might actually be bigger, but it didn't feel necessarily bigger. But the more important thing on Disney ships is there are a lot of cabins with interconnecting doors. And I would strongly encourage, if you're traveling without kids, to choose one without an interconnecting door, because if you've got four or five people in the next cabin, it could be really noisy. I mean, I could even hear the family in the cabin next door to me a bit, and I didn't even have an interconnected door. Many of the cabins have, by the way, what's known as a split bathroom. So you have one bathroom, which has a toilet and a basin, and another right next to it, which has a, a bath with shower in and a basin. And this, of course, is great for families. However, it does mean that some people find the bathrooms are a little bit more cramped. I'm six foot two, and it probably was a little bit on the tight side, but that's something to bear in mind. Also, when you choose a cabin, make sure you choose one that's not on the deck with the kids' clubs, because there's a lot of to and fro and movement at pretty much all hours of the day and into the night. If you're traveling with a friend rather than a partner and not looking to share a bed, know that in many of the cabins, it's a fixed queen bed, unlike other cruise lines, which the bed can be split into twins. Also, bear in mind that many, many cabins on board are designed for multiple occupancy. So the one I was in could sleep at least three other people, so five people in that cabin. And because of this, you'll feel that the ship is much fuller than the capacity number suggests, as they can sail at between 150 and 160 percent capacity because they basically have loads of people sharing cabins so it can feel pretty cramped. And once you're on the ship you'll find a simple and what I think is a really well thought out layout in terms of finding your way around. I find it really easy to get around but there's a couple of things that I found that people use to improve their way of navigating the decks. Now first of all Many people decorate their stateroom doors to make them easy to find, and many of them are really, really intricate. Also, what Disney does to make it even easier, with the cabins on the port side, that's the left-hand side, they have metal fish outside the door, and the fish points towards the rear of the ship, helping you when you come out of the cabin and knowing which way to head, and I use that quite a lot. On the other side, the starboard side, you, you'll then be looking for seahorses if you're on that side. The carpets, they feature a compass which has lots and lots of stars in it, and the pointy part of the star is pointing towards the front of the ship. So there's lots of little things there to help you find your way around, so use them. Invocation Day offers you an open house for the kids' clubs, and I would strongly recommend, if you're traveling with our kids, to go and see these areas, because first of all, they're huge, and it's the only time that adults are really allowed in, and they are worth seeing, even if you don't have kids. They are incredible. They have the Oceania Club, for ages three to 11, which is amazing and huge. They have a play side, then they have a lab side, which is more interactive. Then they have Edge for the 11 to 14 year olds and Vibe for teens 15 to 17. They also have It's a Small World Nursery. Absolutely go and see those. When it comes to dining, it's very different to most cruise lines, although a couple of cruise lines are introducing a similar concept of giving you different main dining rooms to rotate around. But basically what you have is you have rotating dining. The way it works, for example, on my Disney Magic trip, there were three main dining rooms and I was allocated a different one each night. And the same serving staff though moved with you and you had the same table number every night. So there was Rapunzel's Royal Table, which is all themed around Tangled. 
There was Animator's Palette, which is all linked to animation. Then there was Lumiere's, which is linked to Beauty and the Beast. There were slightly different ones on different Disney ships around different themes. If you don't like the, the order of the rotation and the number of times you go into the same restaurant twice, you could go and get that change. Just make sure you do it on the first day. Now, I was traveling solo, so they gave me the option of having a table by myself. Normally, they group people together, but you can ask for the table size you want and even seating with different types of people based on what your preference is. What they don't have is they don't have open seated dining. So you either must choose early or late dining. Late dining is a really good idea if you're traveling with adults, less kids tend to be in there. You're also though limited on alternative dining, which I did actually find an issue. On other cruise lines, the buffet, which is called Cabanas on Disney, was closed at night. It was, you know, it didn't open at all. Uh, on other cruises, when it's open, it's not a buffet though, it's a sit down menu. There is other informal dining like Pinocchio Pizza and Duck in Burgers. Though only the burger place was open in the evening and it's not a particularly great place to eat in the evening. Room service though is 24 hours and has no extra charge. But pretty much you're locked into those three sort of show type restaurants. There are characters everywhere you go, so be ready for them. They're at the sail away, end of cruise party, deck parties. They literally pop up all over the place. Now people queue for them day and night when they do the meet and greets as it were. But what's great is you can take photos with your own camera or phone and the crew will actually do that for you. If you want a more professional option, you can. They offer extensive photograph packages. I thought they were pretty costly, but everyone I spoke to said they were great value because you can get you know, hundreds and hundreds of photos for one set price. Individual photos cost me about $20 each. In terms of Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi is expensive. It cost me $210 for seven days. But on the plus side, it was way, way better than many people had said I was able to stream, for example. I was traveling as a solo adult, and one of the things that was pushed to me was the importance and the amazingness of the adult-only areas by fans of the line. Now, personally, I didn't find them quite as I'd expected. It wasn't so much a ship within a ship for adults as I thought. It was, though, a place where you could dip into, you could retreat from the full-on Disney experience, and that was a plus. Now, the adult-only area facilities and activities were interesting because although they probably do have more dedicated adult-only areas than many other cruise lines, in fact, I think probably any other cruise line, there were some limitations to them. Now, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the best areas is on the pool deck with Signals Bar and Cove Cafe. They really enforce that uh, in terms of being adult only. The gym, the spa, especially the restaurant are also adult only. After dark area, after 9 p.m. is available for adults. There are three key things in there. There's Fathoms, which is like a cabaret lounge, Keys, which is a cocktail piano bar, and a Gills, which is an Irish themed pub. Now, you also get some adult only activities like martini, mixology, chocolate and champagne tastings, some adult cabaret, some adult game shows, some adult trivia. Uh, but again, that's pretty much after 9 p.m. at night. The one thing I probably disliked the most about Disney revolved around gratuities, and I think you absolutely need to know about this. People warned me about this. They warned me that the crew would keep pushing for good ratings and tips. So what actually happens with the gratuities and what do they do that's very different? Now, towards the end of the cruise, you get this piece of paper which tells you how much auto gratuities have been taken. In my case, it was $14.50 per day. There were then little tear-off slips which named each of the key crew members that I've encountered or worked with. So, you know, the, the server, the cabin steward, and then printed on it what their share of the gratuities would be. Now, the idea is you tear those slips off, you put them in an envelope which they provide, and you hand them to the crew member, of course. They already know how much gratuity they're getting because it's a formula. So I really felt that there was a lot of pressure on me and other guests to give extra tips. And I found that uncomfortable. And I felt that the crew were kind of new this and they kind of lobbied for it. But be ready for this. If you found all of these tips really interesting and you want to know more about Disney Cruises, watch this video where I talk about some key fears that I had, including one thing that people accused me of before I went on the cruise and what I discovered once I was on that they were right, it did actually happen. See you over there.